Okay, let's wait a few more seconds. Mm. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Dmitry Vilensky and I'm moderator or hosting this session of ERI Institute of Radical Imagination School of Mutation. And it's a series of whatever we call it, assemblies or iteration, which actually I'm hosting one of the program, which more dedicated to the role of art in our changing reality. Of course, when we started, it was more related to that COVID pandemic transformation of reality. But at the same time, as we see, COVID really triggers so many social and political processes in the world, which can hardly be separated. Doesn't matter about the genealogy or um, uh, context of the appearance, particular in this very dramatic year for everyone. But mm, my idea was that through that certain discussions, how the role of art dramatically changed in this time, we really have better comprehension of the world and situation how artists and art and culture in general could react to this changing situation. And I'm very happy today that after a few different, completely in different direction iteration, a few previous one were dedicated to forthcoming visit of Zapatista delegation to Europe. And it was really very important debate and ERI Institute of Radical Imagination very close related and cooperate with this movement, which is very important for us. But today we have completely another, completely, I don't know if it's the right word. I hope everything is interconnected and we'll see today how they are. Uh, we discuss the situation of very tragic and at the same time at certain moment was really very inspiring political movement in Belarus, which was quite broadly covered by international news. And recently, not only recently, but we mentioned already in our informal talk before the session that actually today we have three different events in different geographic location, most of them online, of course, actually, uh, dedicated to Belarusian art and culture, which at that moment made incredibly important contribution to reconsideration of relation between art and politics, which actually our program and Institute of Radical Imagination more or less focused on this particular issue. And I'm very happy to greet today Olga Kapionkina, independent curator from New York, originally from Belarus, and made very important exhibition and statement and also quite active right now in um, reflecting and contributing to the process of development of Ukrainian, oh, sorry, <laughs> of Belarusian cultural situation. Also, we have Antonina Stibur, and for me it's very big pleasure because Antonina was participant of our school and made also amazing exhibition House of Culture, Rosa House of Culture in Petersburg. Actually, I would say that we are here in Russia feel very close connection for many years already, I would say maybe from late uh, 2010 or 2008, because uh, Russia and Belarus is a kind of figuration of kind of state, very tricky um, um, legal, type of relation between two independent states with unfortunately very strong and very dirty intervention of Russian state into Belarusian situation. And this summer after election, we saw very crucial role of Russia in crushing the Belarusian protest. I would even say bluntly that without that intervention, Belarusian people will be unfortunately it happened 
So, and also because of the language, as you noticed before, when we were warming up before um, the session, we use Russian language, so language is not a barrier. So, and there are many similarities and we also could discuss later how Russian situation in a very kind of bad way, <laughs> repeating the repressive regime of Lukashenko and Belarusian state and regulation of public sphere and demonstration and also cultural processes. So we are really very sensitive and very attentive to this process. And in our Rosa House of Culture, we did many events last two shows were dedicated to Belarusian prote uh, protest. So I would say I'm maybe not so familiar, but at the same time, yes, it's definitely major focus for Russian cultural scene. So, and Antonina also curator, and she right now co-curating one of the important exhibition in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Arsenal. It's an amazing visual tour, which I made. Unfortunately, till now only in Ukrainian, but at the same time you can get into, and as the curators told me, it will be soon also English version and probably Russian. So, and Antonina is very involved also in a group of different support of psychological and also financial and, all other type of support which people abroad can really provide to the movement. And also Alexei, also very happy to see you. Haven't seen you for a long time, but it was always a pleasure to meet. And last time you also distributed your brilliant book about, um, I forgot how, uh, Observing Solidarity. So it was really, important to realize together with Swedish um, uh, partnership with certain Swedish organization. I don't remember which one. So, but anyway, so the floor is yours. And first we listen to Olga and then slowly move to another contribution. And then as usual, this um, gathering plan as a kind of open assembly where everyone can contribute and share the voices. You can do it in the chat. You can just simply raise your hand. I carefully watch and of course everyone um, can say something in relation to our topic and also your vision of the situation, which at the moment becomes more and more, I would say dramatic, at least from Russian perspective after protest of last, week so to say so thanks everyone so olga i'm really welcome you and yeah thanks yeah. everyone for joining us mm -hmm. yeah thank you for the introduction dmitry um i uh and it's very very good to be here and uh talk on the on your platform uh i think i had one discussion um on the platform it was great um in this difficult for belarus time i invited uh, antonina and alex to discuss the artists engagement with uh, with the ongoing protest in belarus this conversation actually sprawls from the publication in moscow our journal uh, which focused on the role of artists in this protest that I happened to read and I got very interested and I decided that why don't we have a broader discussion um, uh, that uh, about forms of artists participation and political transformation in general so uh, start uh, using Belarus as an example um, but before we go to the point of our discussion, I would like to describe uh, the moment in which Belarusian protest finds itself right now, especially for those who are not in Belarus and didn't follow the news. But I assume that everybody who's, who joined us for this discussion is somehow uh, already already aware of what's going on. And yes, Dima, uh, Dima was right that it's been covered uh, quite intensely in, in the press, in the international press, 
uh, actually not recently because I don't see uh, you know the coverage in the Western press uh, so much now these days as compared to how it was covered in August and last fall. Anyway, of course I can talk, only talk from my safe distance of living in New York uh, where we enjoy more freedom. Uh, while in Belarus the government repressions reached its peak, the state targets not only politicians and activists, but regular citizens, among whom are a lot of cultural workers. Uh, practically anybody, anybody can be arrested and face criminal charges for just walking on the street or wearing certain colors that resembles historic Belarusian flag, or making an exhibition or simply exhibiting an artwork. As for today in Belarus, there are more than 300 political prisoners. Newly released report titled Politically Motivated Criminal Charges in Belarus for Years 2020 and 2021, prepared by human rights organization, organization Vesna, which means spring, states that there are more than 3,000 so called extremists or politically motivated cases initiated by, by the Belarusian government. 3,000, uh, you know, for the population, which is uh, not even 10 millions, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big number. More than 70% of those who have been charged are waiting for trials in jail, which is also a big number because before, if we compare this uh, with what happened 10 years ago when there was a similar political crisis over the elections, fraud, um, usually people would wait for trial at home. You know, they will be charged, but they waited for trial at home. But now 70% of those who are charged are waiting for trials in jail. That's also a lot. But Belarusian protest went through different stages. The first few months, uh, the last August and the fall, were marked by mass mobilization and determination to change the government by peaceful means. Um, let me let me share uh, some slide presentation with you. Can you see it? Can you see it? Okay. Yes. Uh, um, uh, yeah, but uh, by peaceful means and also by expressions of dignity and courage, especially by women when facing arrests and beating and by solidarity with victims of police brutality. Cultural, cultural workers found themselves in the avant-garde of political movement. Um, When the news about tortures of people during the arrests began to circulate, actors of the major state Belarusian theater went on strike, musicians followed by performing on the streets and in the subways. Artists staged their own strike, taken on the streets as opposed to exhibiting in the official venues. So here you can see on this image, uh, a protest, uh, don't paint, strike. Um, that was organized about the same time, but almost at the same time with Kupala Theater and with the musicians. Um, another another uh, action, uh, Art of the Regime, in which artists were holding the images of bruised and tortured bodies, uh, was staged about, uh, also at the same time and also in front of the same uh, place, which is um, state-run Palace of Arts in Minsk. Um, uh, in, yeah, in Minsk, the capital of Belarus. At some point, the process began to exploit its own aesthetic regime, if we can use the concierge's words, when practically everyone on the street became a visual activist, when aesthetics was the main motivation for people to get out. Um, for example, to wave a flag that you made or protect the white, white and red shrine arranged by neighbors in the yard or sport self-made outfits, repaint a protest mural raised by the police 
as if citizens fulfilled an avant-garde dream of merging aesthetics and life in the most unexpected way. Uh, for example, by making a colorful composition with clothes on the balcony, not necessarily thinking about, about it as art making. Actually, in one of my favorite uh, examples uh, that I read in the press was when, after the multiple police repressions against people who dried red and white clothes on the balconies uh, or putting them in the windows, uh, and of course, most of the time intentionally, right, manifesting the allegiance to the uh, alternative Belarus, right, and historic flag. Uh, a citizen engaged housing authorities who came to remove uh, his red and white towels uh, from the ba balcony in an absurd correspondence, asking them to send them instructions how to dry clothes. Um, uh, anyway, aesthetic activism that emerged in Belarus is similar to other contemporary protests, such as Black Lives Matter, um, uh, student, protest, uh, student protesters from Hong Kong, and earlier Occupy Wall Street. Uh, all of them signal an emergent paradigm whereby, as artist and writer Gregory Chalet noted, activist art and art of activism blur, transpose, and converge. Julia Ramirez Blanco have described the Occupy movement as both political and aesthetic entity, while Yates Mikey proposed that Occupy Wall Street was itself a work of socially engaged art. In other words, Anyone, yeah, and here you also see the quotation from uh, Belarusian poet Dmitry Strotsev, uh, who uh, defined the Belarusian protest as asymmetrical, aesthetically calibrated response to the state brutal force. Uh, in other words, anyone who fell out of the daily schedules create art these days. On the other hand, precariousness, economic and political instabilities that professional artists embody, especially in Belarus, where the art market is rudimental and artists still rely on state-run institutions who don't really serve them, right? And they never did because they only serve to the top of their, you know, artists' union nomenclature. Uh, so this precariousness bring them to the front of social political transformation. Our participants can elaborate on that a little bit more in relation to Belarus. I will only add that over the past months, we watched how alternative and independent spaces that serve the communities and even forged the communities, at least in the last 10 years, have been closing. They've been, they were shot by authorities or sometimes they just made a decision to close because of the um, uh, security because of their you know issue with police and um, the uh, insecurities anyway revolutions and insurrections always open opportunities for artists and the question i posed for this discussion is um, actually quite a few questions. Uh, what forms of organization and collaboration between artists, between artists and non-artists have emerged during this protest? What alliances and coalitions have emerged or should be, or should emerge, maybe they will emerge in the future to ensure cultural survival in the future, given that in Belarus and Russia as well, culture itself is under threat. And again, I want to draw the comparison with the Western uh, European and American societies uh, where culture is usually a shelter, right? Culture can shelter the people, protesters, uh, who want to express uh, the political views. Uh, and culture creates this kind of safe space for them. But in Russia and Belarus, uh, it's not the case, right? So that because the culture itself is under threat. So how in this situation when independent art spaces have closed, exhibition canceled and cultural practitioners even went to jail, 
not only protest, but any public expressions are no, no longer possible. How should artists act? I know there are also ethical questions, whether art production in traditional sense should stop in time of a revolution. What we put, uh, the question that we put in the press release attributed to Egyptian artists, right, who formulated this question during the Arab Spring and 2011. And I hope we will be able to discuss it too. And since we have international crowd here, we can brainstorm strategies and methods with Antonin and Alexei, also with those who already went through similar experiences. Everybody is welcome to participate and share their thoughts and comparisons with other protests are welcome. Um, that's all I wanted to uh, to say, now I want to pass, uh, pass the button to Antonina. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would I would like to say several words um, that uh, uh, the dialogue between me and Alexei that is uh, that has a huge history because we keep in touch. Uh, I think uh, for the first day of protests, and uh, to tell the truth, is these dialogues about protests, about um, artists, about art, Bel Belarusian art, as well. Uh, truly helped me uh, avoid um, frustration, the level of frustration to make a, dis a distance for reflection. So it's uh, so the article that Olga um, have mentioned, um, the article in uh, uh, Moscow Art Magazine uh, was a result of this huge uh, discussion between me and Alexei. And I saw that it's really interesting because we um, we always speak in uh, different positions because I am a creator and researcher and 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 Alexei is most um, well known as artist. So I think that it's a great um, communication between curator and artist um, and we uh, we have uh, not a completely different, but of course we have a difference in our um, interpretation of art and uh, the role of artist in the protest as well. Um, so I think that it's, uh, it can be a very interesting uh, communication. So I want to return to our topic and the question uh, that uh, Joe Ali asked in your article, not time for art. Uh, I think it's very appropriate for the Belarusian, for the Belarusian art sphere and art uh, context. Um, because during the protest and for as well as during the, our preparation of uh, exhibition every day that uh, opened in uh, Mr. Skersenal in Kyiv, we um, communicate with uh, many Belarusian artists and uh, we um, always, uh, uh, time by time, we heard something like that artist asked um, that during the protest, the period of depression and the first days of violence um, repression or the following months of repression of a uh, against any, form of uh, disagreements or any form of, um, how to say, or any form of um, uh, resistance. Uh, artists, uh, artists uh, many Belarusian artists ask, um, what the hell is art? Or for example, maybe, um, why is art, why, why is art really neat? Um, especially now when uh, people being killed in the street or as Olga uh, have mentioned um, that today we have uh, more than uh, 300 uh, political prisoner, official uh, political prisoners in Belarus. So it's a really sensitive uh, question for us. Or we, we, we always heard another uh, other question. Uh, what can I do? as artist uh, and because many artists felt and feel um, deep frustration 
uh, seen how how ordinary people, um, even probably these people uh, have never visited a museum and galleries of contemporary art, how these ordinary people um, effectively use uh, the language of art. Uh, so, and um, the art language no longer belongs to a small professional group of artists. Uh, and of course, uh, that's why I just ask, what uh, do they really uh, um, may do in this in this context? But I think uh, that I suppose that Alexei told uh, this um, um, about this in more detail. I I would like to say that of course there are Belarusian protest context and there how people and the mm, reason. And, and the situation how people use their um, language of art. And um, I think that changes their um, context um, of the, the context of uh, artists and the art. And of course, uh, I think that um, it's really important um, that we should ask uh, many questions. For example, uh, where do where is the border between art and, and non-art? Where is the border between um, me as artist and me as uh, um, citizen, or the border between uh, um, uh, political and aesthetic? Of course, it's a very important question. And I'd like to say about, I'd like to um, just, uh, I, I'd like to show several slides um, about uh, different strategies, how different Belarusian artists um, use different strategies to work with uh, political context and uh, to work with uh, the figure uh, and to interpret, uh, interpret um, uh, themselves uh, as uh, uh, artists, uh, how it changed. And uh, one minute, I try to share slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, first of all, I, want, uh, I would like to say that uh, not presenting the fact that uh, in my mind, um, Belarusian prose uh, and artists it's good context for rare understanding or uh, reflect about new instruments or new position um, about artist as a figure. Uh, of course, we know that um, several Belarusian artists uh, uh, continue to use uh, the previous strategies or um, uh, that concerned with aestheticization and heroization, uh, or how to say, when we speak about uh, um, political art or actionism, um, they use uh, method aestheticization of heroization. And of course, I, I'd like to mention the action of uh, Alexei Kuzmich, I believe. Uh, it was a, a two-part action uh, where he appeared as a, a Jesus Christ. Uh, um, this is very classical uh, hero, um, how to say this, very classic classical appearance as art as extremely status as a hero. So, and I think that maybe today uh, we should reflect that this gesture as a problematic gesture because uh, uh, this, um, this um, and I would like to discuss it because uh, to my mind, uh, it can be problematic because uh, uh, there are many statization, uh, there are too much statization as a section uh, in comparison with political point of view. And of course, uh, I'm not sure about uh, when we speak about uh, Belarusian protest, we speak about the protest against a hierarchy structure, authority structure, patriarchy strike, strike structure. And uh, can we uh, can be opposed to these uh, uh, force hierarchy structure, another force hierarchy figure as an artist. That's why when we discuss in our uh, magazine, in, in, in our article for uh, Moscow Art Magazine, uh, I, I told that the figure of uh, artist uh, is uh, non-ethical. Of course, I don't, I don't think that every uh, 
artist as a figure is non-ethical. But I would like to say that this, uh, um, this is there, the figure of uh, artist as a hero, the hero in uh, one one hero gesture. Artist uh, maybe is not uh, ethical, especially with, when we speak about. Um, during the violent period of protest, because I uh, we we discussed a lot of with any other artists, and I know that many artists in Belarus, uh, especially, didn't uh, do any um, activist uh, gestures uh, during the first day of protest because they don't they didn't want to exp exp explode uh, their. Uh, the, the political contest. Uh, but um, what's next is really interesting that, um, as I say, that um, very often, one minute, I try to. Oh my God, something goes wrong. Uh -huh. um, that um, when you speak about uh, political activists' um, gestures in the art sphere, very often uh, it's very difficult to mark as art or even uh, um, artist or cultural workers who make um, this political gesture uh, don't, uh, didn't or don't describe it as art or it's very difficult to, um, to define this border. Um, as an example, I can see um, we, can, uh, we can discuss the uh, Ulyana Nevzorova uh, happening. Uh, this poster could be the reason for my detention and the, la the next uh, her action, uh, I will not be able to forget this August when Ulyana, uh, like ordinary people, like ordinary person, stay in ordinary situation uh, for the first time in uh, subway, for the second uh, time for a uh, very crowded street. And uh, she has, she had a poster with this uh, notion, uh, with this notes, and uh, keep calm about it. So, uh, and when we discussed with Uliana about this, it's very difficult. It's very hard to uh, to say uh, either it um, a civil statement or a artist statement. So, because it's like a a shimmer or flickering uh, statement between uh, civil and artist gesture. And um, more obviously, um, we have another, another example when uh, the group of female art uh, cultural workers and activists, uh, she make a um, activistic video. I am, we are the president of Republic of Belarus. Uh, she, um, she read the um, speech of uh, the inauguration speech of the president of Republic of Belarus um, to disagree with the statement of president of uh, Lukashenko uh, speech when he said that um, we, women cannot be a president in Belarus or, for example, the constitution didn't write uh, for women. So, but uh, what is very important for this action uh, that um, for this group of uh, cultural workers, very important to mark this uh, gesture, not as art gesture, but like a civil statement for them. No, they really fear it when we discuss it. They are really, really very fear that uh, when we speak about this video as, a, first of all, as a piece of art, uh, it leads to decrease uh, the political um, decrease the, the political statements and uh, uh, to start the process of statization. And they want to avoid it because they want to. They have a very direct uh, political goal, and as well as uh, Olga Kapankina mentioned, this um, action, the art of regime, is very important because. This is not, it's also flickering uh, or shimmer um, action between civil or political uh, protest and um, artist action. Because uh, um, in this uh, in this section and in this section, don't draw strike um, 
cultural workers uh, came together um, on the second part on this uh, action to support uh, um, how to say the all state strike on the, on, on this action uh, come to get came together to to see the art of regime to uh, to increase uh, their protest against um, high level of violence it's very important that it's so uh, very important action uh, when uh, cultural worker uh, work together they and um, what is very important that um, even protests not pandemic situation um, like in many other countries but um protest um was the trigger for discussion um the artist's work and the um, creation different infrastructural um different structure for supporting artists and for collaboration artists so it's very interesting and the next strategy that I want to uh, discuss uh, is uh, the so-called long, when we understand about long-term protest and when we speak about long-term um, um, long term uh, art. Uh, and for, for example, I'd like to, to show the EEFFF group who create the museum, the so-called the Museum of Future. I should uh, say several words about it because it's, uh, it's completely different strategy um, in comparison with uh, previous. Because in previous, we see the direct gesture against or um, the gesture about a uh, disagreement with something, for example, disagreement with um, violence, or with uh, elections and so on, but in this, point of view, uh, they work not, um, not with the whole society. They, this ta their target audience or they uh, work not with the whole society, but they work with very direct, uh, very uh, specific community. Uh, during two months, this, um, this uh, artist live in, uh, in the protest neighborhood. Uh, they work together, they, uh, they live together, they um, met each other with uh, any other neighbors. And um, during one, one weekend, uh, um, where, where full of uh, different activities and events, uh, for example, at the same time with this uh, activity, um, they, are where, they were um, lectures, um, concerts, uh, cooking, eating together, and so on. So uh, during this, uh, like, uh, not festival, but how to say, uh, the weekend activity of neighborhood, they propose uh, their open activity to come to connection um, other neighbors um, to create and to think about the museum of future. Uh, they propose to, um, they, pro they create the workshop, uh, but they use the instrument of, um, to follow the instrument of political imagination following. Um, just thinking that we live um, that we live in future now, and what the museum of protest and how the museum of protest um, uh, would be organized, and people start to think about, and it's very important because it it was not about uh, imagination uh, in general, but it was a political imagination, and people start to think what is very important for them, what is less important for them, different common. Um, sense or where uh, they have different sense and what's the next uh, things really important that in comparison with, for example, the first action that I've described, uh, this uh, uh, action and the EEFFF uh, specially avoid uh, to the medialization of this action and uh, during our uh, prepare, during our preparation of our exhibition um, every day in Mr. Arsenal, we ask them to show these uh, documentation in our exhibition and for them was very ethical ethical to uh, to refuse uh, about our um, asking 
because they say that um, it was very important to do something um, in concrete situation. So, and um, for, for example, the next uh, to work with concrete community is, uh, is, is work um, by Nadia Sayapina who, who work with uh, their core prisoners. Um, she was arrested and uh, she spent uh, 15 days um, in two prisons and uh, in two scissors. And she, she worked with uh, girls and women uh, who, um, who have the same experience. Uh, uh, they met together, they discuss, and uh, she organizes um, the space uh, for discussing, for, uh, for entrepreneurship of, of, for, of this experience. Uh, not like a experience of violence, but uh, like a um, very important experience of uh, care, of political care and the experience of resistance. So it's, it's two examples and we have uh, examples also. These two examples is very important because in, in comparison with the first part of my speech, these two examples um, are connected not uh, with direct protest jest, but for the creation or um, uh, for the creation infrastructure of the space for um, that involved not abstract, uh, abstract people uh, or general people, but very concrete community that have this uh, and the artist and non adherents for the first uh, for the first example they have they live together in one in one neighborhood for the second for the second um, example uh, they have uh, the common experience uh, to live uh, to spend um, 15 days in, in prison so and to reflect and to work with this uh, experience. So I think that we have uh, these two different, um, these two different very important um, strategy uh, for protest. Uh, the first is a direct gest, and the second is to creation support and care, care infrastructure. That's very important. And, and the second is long term, very invisible, uh, very calm, and uh, how to say very uh, the the manner of creation of art uh, that work with concrete society and or concrete community and as well as uh, the uh, re uh, re understanding the role of art the artist as a mediator of of a communicator so I'd like to discuss um, two of this strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Antonina. It was really important categorization and actually pretty much embraced. And also, I uh, maybe later we discuss because for me, it's a bit lacking that participatory mode of creation, which I see in EFF and maybe in this kind of drawings from the jail. So, because that actually would be very important possibility of artists to develop and protest together with the people and also overcome that separation which we uh, made difference between the two subjectivities of the crowd and subjectivity of the artist. Okay, but I hope it will be continue after last presentation by Alexei, so you can really start. And yeah, welcome. Uh, hello, thank you, Dmitry. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Olga. Thank you for inviting and organizing this event. And uh, yes, thank you for your words, for your inputs, and thank you, Antonina, for really these discussions that we had during these months and uh, for this collaboration. Because, like, really, it is a. I, I see it as a quite a nice partnership. In, uh, in work, in research, or in uh, creation of texts and something like that. 
Yeah, and uh, it was really important. I think it will be still uh, in the next months and years. So um, I want to come... Uh, I have like three points and I'm going to uh, describe a little bit them, like to walk around them. So, and uh, the first one is what is important for me from the input that uh, Olga gave us with the, with the text and we're from the uh, input uh, as a reference from uh, this uh, text about uh, events in Egypt and the references to Occupy Wall Street and others that uh, in Belarusian situation, I want to uh, uh, put a special attention at this time of revolution. Yeah, uh, the, is the art possible in time of revolution? Here is, uh, for me, is like two modes of time, right? Time of events, time of the revolution, like in the Belarusian situation, it's August, let's say, and what happened after August, what happens now, it's got a different phase, obviously, but still it is kind of revolution. Phase. And what we have had before, so what we have had, what came, what, what brought us to this point of August uh, last year, to August 2020, uh, it is uh, actually, uh, for me, it is a work that was conducted uh, by many artists, not only artists, but other cultural specialists, by any, like I say, galleries, institutions of different kind, by NGOs and journalists, probably, that was conducted during the 10th, during this period from the events of 2010 till the last year. And uh, this uh, uh, this time, it wasn't just like wasted or it wasn't just like, you know, just something happened in August or last year. No, that was pretty a long uh, work. And probably this time for art, uh, the time for art in the last decade that we had the last decade, it was kind of uh, kind of different, like if you want to compare it to Russia or to other countries, because like many artists who who came uh, today, who participate today in this exhibition, for for instance, like uh, every uh, like, like every day in Kiev, so they they were quite active in the social and political engagement during this decade. So, and uh, there were different formats of the events, not only the exhibitions, not only gallery formats, uh, white Cubans, etc. but there also were, a, were uh, quite a big number of seminars, quite a big number of collaborations with uh, different NGOs. And uh, it's, uh, on one point, it's quite an interesting thing. And I can see it as a, a positive moment that the, this very engagement uh, happened, but it, it brought some. <laughs> To us, yeah, I brought some results. But on the other point is kind of uh, put their limits, put the limits on the artistic practices. We have had uh, this uh, kind of opportunity, the horizon of artistic statements that was quite limited by this engagement because many artists, they couldn't, they couldn't afford to be less political, for instance. Because this political involvement and this involvement with issues, with different issues, like, for instance, like LGBTQ plus agenda or feminist agenda or ecological agenda, it was quite a big thing in Belarusian contemporary art. Yeah, we have had a kind of official scene where it's linked to official institutions that, as Olga have said, that didn't do much, actually, for artists, mostly extracted their work was extracted and didn't give any, even not, not, not much sufficient fees for their participation in the events and exhibitions. But at the same time, uh, this uh, alternative scene, how we call it, uh, which was uh, uh, concentrated around Gallery U, for instance, or Gallery Tsech, or Gallery Keha, most recently, uh, it, it was quite active. and. Uh, it was a kind of sacrifice that was mentioned in this text that uh, that, that was posted before our discussion. Yeah? So this sac sacrifice already was made by several artists, not in August last year, but before, because a part of their practice that was already socially and politically engaged. It already worked for these changes for quite a long time. So, and uh, so, and also, to be frank, it was, for some of them, for many of them, it was also um, 
an opportunity for exposure, an opportunity for being seen, as there are not so much uh, not so much art market indeed in Belarus, and there are not so much private gallery that uh, do that uh, do pretty good sales and something like that. Uh, this engagement it was something in between of the kind of civil duty that people uh, decided to do just to be active and the exposure as a second point and the opportunity yeah opportunity to be presented to be shown in the galleries in belarus or at the exhibitions in other countries as well so it's quite a complex situation in art scene a particular part of the art scene in belarus and minsk and brest more particularly yeah that that brought us to this uh engagement, the more mass engagement of artists into the protest or cultural workers into the protest. Because this was a kind of quite a collaboration between different actors from different uh, spheres uh, of, uh, yeah, of culture or of uh, civil knowledge and activities during this decade. So that was my first point. And uh, from here, we're coming to the event, to the event of uh, revolution, to the, these events that we are somehow experiencing now. And uh, here also, we can, I can see at least this prolongation of the situation. So it comes to some extreme point, to the point of activity. Because before uh, the culture, as the political statements, the political actions, street rallies, and other political activities, open confrontation of the uh, of the uh, of the regime of the current government, or call it whatever you want, uh, it wasn't possible this direct confrontation. So art and culture, it was like probably in the, the context of U.S. Uh, the safe zone when one can could speak when one could do their job so the job is for uh, for sure it is uh, the goal of this job is to bring changes so slowly with the help of uh, different specialists with help of independent journalists with help of this and that so this it was kind of step by step this moment uh, uh, was near and we were coming closer and closer to this so and the last election, there was just an opportunity, something that triggered, yeah, probably coronavirus also and other aspects, but indeed there was a situation before. So, and, uh, and uh, yeah. And uh, here also, like, I want to mention uh, the thing that in, I just recalled it that in year 2014, I was organizing a small discussion in Gallery U, and that was a discussion about the political art or probabilities for art to be political, what the difference. And so there was, a, I remember there was an argument about, about uh, is it art or is it a political statement or is it an activism? And this difference between two uh, was quite crucial for artists because no, not everybody wanted to cross this line, cross this border that, we, uh, that, that was just discussed, yeah? Because uh, art is really a safe zone. And uh, now when we are coming to the place where there is no safety, when there are uh, no any safe zones, no any galleries, because galleries are closed, they are, uh, they are, they are risky, they are too risky to have. They are they're not allowed because they're, they're point of confrontation, they are point of opposition that should be suppressed, obviously. Yeah? And uh, for me now, the situation after August is more, more clear somehow and more obvious and uh, I didn't have like Dmitry said I didn't have much uh, much doubts about what this uh, government or what they those state officials who are in charge what what they are so probably this facade of uh, nice design or all the possibilities for collaborations with uh, foreign organizations or with these nice uh, cafes on the nice hipster street or something like that it was really like uh, quite, quite quite a good uh, facade, and behind this facade, there is still the machine of violence, as uh, any state is a machine of violence. Yeah, and probably when the state uh, not controlled, there are not these uh, limitations for the state power. Obviously, it is there. And now that we we, we have seen that during the uh, last months, is just obviously just on the streets, it's just just coming into action. So. 
So, and because of that, obviously, the, all those galleries were closed because they were the points of opposition even before. And all those people who were who were uh, uh, who were organizing some projects that were quite a challenge in this. Uh, these uh, authorities, there is the, the status quo and this uh, legitimacy of the of the government. They were closed. They're still keeping be suppressed. Yeah, there are criminal charges and uh, any other repression. So it's quite quite a quite a clear, obvious situation that we have have now. So and what can art do in this situation of the protest? Because before it was quite. Active, yeah, it was quite quite right to do art, to do culture, to use these uh, ways of kind of uh, scheming a little bit, talking about culture, but talking about politics, yeah, and so uh, doing this and that, uh, playing a partisan as a as a kind of kind of concept uh, in Belarus, popular in Belarus during 2000, 2020, I guess, and uh, so today, what art can do. And what art could do after the August 9th. So because of that, there was a much confusion between those artists who were be who were politically and socially engaged before. Because now all the art that we all the kinds of art, artistic language that Antonina mentioned, was on the streets. So there were like plenty of artists on the streets, and so they were the same, pretty pretty similar at least, yeah. And that was a kind of confusion. What they can do as, as the professionals, yeah. What what kind of art they can bring, if to continue this work as uh, as kind of significant figures, as heroes who who not who are not afraid to challenge the uh, the government in the exhibitions or in these artistic safe zones, if to continue this line. It's probably yeah a little bit strange. It's not so actual. It's not so contemporary because I guess uh, contemporaneity uh, demanded more direct actions, more direct and obvious involvement into this, uh, into the protest, and not posing as you are could do before. Before it was probably effective, but now it's kind of it's uh, a little bit outdated. So that that's kind of my opinion, and. Uh, and here we come into to these two modes. Uh, for instance, uh, the artist Antonina Slavojko, she, in the, I remember her post from uh, from the August, I guess, at the end of August, and uh, she she wrote in this post that this uh, this time uh, this time needs no pieces of art, but only placards only slogans and something like that. And what artists can produce now, it's just something, something you use, some utility, something uh, really useful. Because there are not, not even possibility, I, I, I guess like for me, it isn't much possibility of creating sophisticated works of art during this time because you need some space for your mind. And uh, when you are inside, when you are in the protest, it's too much emotions. There, there are no distance at all. So they're quite a quick reactions on this thing, on that thing, and it's lit literally physical reactions sometimes. So so the role of artists here, I, I, I can think that it can be more a role of the citizen. Yeah. Or maybe it can be used, the artistic language still can be used, but it is used uh, what, what is the goal of using of artistic language? Yeah, the goal is exposure, and the goal is some profit, so they are selling it somewhere, if, if it possible. Yeah, later, I don't know, but probably this urgency. Yeah, this uh, art as excess art is some some something that is not so necessary. That's something like surplus. It's some some I don't know entertainment or communication or something that people doing in spare time, going to the galleries or going to some meetings or going to the concerts. And this excess can't work anymore. There are no time for this excess. So this time for urgency, yeah, and uh, urgency, it's kind of different mode. 
what is requested by, by, by those events. And uh, also this creation of value, it is also somehow connected with this mode of urgency. The value is only what, what happened right, right in the situation of revolution. Yes. And uh, so, but concluding, I want to also bring kind of point of advocacy probably, because uh, I do really think that no any critique can demand anything from anybody in such situation of unrest, in such situation of uh, quite intense uh, struggle and quite intense repression. Because it is understandable that uh, not everybody is so strong and active the people have their own lives, have their own feelings, their own psychological states, let's say families, children, uh, other obligations. And uh, sometimes, uh, I guess, art can be like keeping doing what people used to do. Uh, it can be kind of self-help, self-therapy uh, self that can... Uh, can bring people through this turbulence, through this time of turbulence, through this time of repression. So, and then probably later, it can brought to the public space and can be shown. So uh, that's why I kind of, I'd rather be here not so critical towards this position or that position. Should should the artist be more like active and engaged, or should should them be like you know? just what they, they naturally feel and uh, you know, want to do in this situation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alexi. Thanks everyone. So I hope we can really have so many entries into the de debate because, and actually you nicely sum up so many positions and actually without uh, certain forcing to one in favor of the other. And of course, situation is pretty difficult and also very dynamic. So, because you speak about August, but August, April, January, it's completely another temporality. And actually, mm, it's quite obvious to mention that actually what might differentiate art from life, it's their own temporality and what usually artists after Walter Benjamin to understand something you need a distance. And the time of turbulence don't provide you a space for distancing. For example, I'm not talking and advocating so-called meta position, but at the same time, like what came into my mind also very old references to 68 or to Jean-Luc Godard. So when it was my 68, he creates together with other people, comrades, uh, Ziga Vertov group, and was trying to reflect events in the midst of the crowd, in the midst of the street doing so-called activist cinema. But his, from my point of view, the biggest, so whatever we call masterpiece was Tuva Bien, very uh, bitter reaction on what transformation it brought into society, what kind of new political and class composition it revealed and so on. So that was a piece which need time. It was done in 1972, four years later. So sometimes I'm also maybe as kind of big position, I would continue your consideration to say not to force artists to be into immediate reaction. So maybe we can judge what Belarusian art would be in four years or five years from now. And then it might be very, very important statement, which my people expect or we all expect from the power of the art because I still believe in art and the possibility to really bring completely new imagination, new kind of way of life and so on. That's why actually I would like maybe to ask because um, actually it was on the list, but at the same time, 
I would really like to ask you what kind of sustainable new structure, because you told galleries collapse, state culture of collapse, what comes on the ruins, you know, what kind of new alliances, what kind of new composition of artists, new type of union protection, because it's not just about artistic statement, it's about what kind of uh, feasible, tangible structures we can build at this moment of uh, upheavals and repression and so on. That also from my Russian perspective, and not only Russian, I would say it's really, really important because if we understand that our uh, temporality is limited to that concrete temporality of event, I think we are doomed. So I would say it's about tactic. Tactic is important, super important. But at the same time, what kind of strategy and strategy for me is what type of new communities we manage to sustain, protect, also help them psychologically and also aesthetically because art make empowerment. So when people still keep singing the revolutionary song, the revolution will come again, you know what I mean? <laughs> so if you could reflect on that and maybe from your practical experience, because I know Antonina also participated in that kind of hybrid activist uh, artist network. So it would be really interesting to know how you in Belarus preparing new grounds for next battles and current uh, resistance. I think, uh, could I start to answer? Yes, please, 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 yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe Alexei, if, if you want to add something, I think that today, especially, we, we uh, actually have dramatic situation in uh, Belarus art in, uh, in context of infrastructure supporting, because almost all gallery closed and uh, uh, for example, one of the uh, owner of uh, owner of uh, gallery who um, was uh, under the prison approximately eight months, as I remember, and uh, the Kaha, the very important institution in Brest, as uh, um, Alexei told, um, also uh, about. Uh, in uh, in gray situation, so I think that um, at the same time uh, we we have uh, uh, when we when we speak about infrastructure at all, not only about the art infrastructures, uh, the the opposing in uh, the opposition uh, uh, infrastructure structures that creation inside the society it's a, a horizontal infrastructure but this infrastructure is very fragile and they need uh, um, a lot of uh, instrument and long term uh, and long to term uh, um, how to say relation uh, for uh, for the work without uh, break and so on so i think that now we have um, a gap but but people by people i think uh, people uh, i think that people support to each other and this uh, supportness is very important and have not only private but first of all political um, point of view political um, i don't know uh, uh, idea um, because uh, today is very important uh, to support each other. And uh, as, as I remember, even in our exhibition, uh, for us, it's, it was very important to support all the artists and to support artists who live lives in Belarus and to make uh, um, a possibility to visit uh, Ukraine to support uh, and to, uh, uh, to give the opportunity to save safety in this point of view. So I think that it's also, this structure is also important, but unfortunately we cannot say about stable, uh, uh, stable outside infrastructure because uh, the, the protests, as uh, uh, Dima, you've, you've mentioned, always change. And what we uh, want, and uh, the, the repression of uh, government also always changes. It means that what we what what we're talking about in August is completely different in comparison with uh, uh, today situation. 
And so I think that uh, I suppose that, the, that this uh, people by people support, uh, support us. Um, I believe in it, that it helps to create, uh, it, 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 it can be, it, it, it is able to, to be a background for new infrastructure. It's my, it's my political talk, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I want to, if you finished, Antonina? Okay. Uh, I want to just to bring two words to add here because like, I guess thinking about future is quite a crucial. And at least I remember several months ago, we were many, many activity, uh, activists or many like, you know, colleagues were talking about future. We're organizing some panels about future. What, what should we do next? What should we think about? What should we plan? Uh, now, uh, as I see, like in recent months, starting this year, probably the beginning of this year, uh, as probably in November, the protests were more or less, mass protests were more or less ceased, yeah, more or less finished. And then we're just uh, district protests and something like that. So the street activities uh, quite at uh, the point of very low, near to zero now. And... Uh, the country comes to natural uh, situation of reaction. Yeah. So now all the activities quite are repressed, everything repressed, and people try to survive. So there are different strategies of uh, the survival to somebody have to stay here because their own reasons, somebody have to leave. But uh, I'd call this time now this time of reaction, like from the government side and time of evaluation. Because what is important to evaluate and understand what, what has happened. And uh, as I was mentioning before, when you analyze, uh, Dima, you was talking also about this, when you have no time, no distance to what happened, you cannot understand, you cannot like think clearly what, what, what is going on and what, what should we do next. So that's now is this time is starting when people more or less trying to stay safe. Uh, I don't know, inhale, exhale, and start to think about what to do next. And also, as I know, uh, there are several initiatives, uh, mostly like self-support groups, informal, like chats, uh, again, like Telegram chats or something, like doing culture workers where people just discuss uh, not directly strategies, but the ways how to keep their practices. Because, because it's not only about some independent curators or not non-affiliated with the institutions, with the mainstream institutions artists. But there are some uh, some employees of the institutions of the state institution that also quite are not so glad to uh, to to see what, what is happening. And there are also strategy of this old partisan movement that I was briefly mentioned before, like a small, small actions inside the territory of the enemy, like that somehow brings the results later probably and slowly like dissolve this monolith of the state power, everything like that. So I guess this, this will be a long process but now there are more knowledge, yeah, more practical knowledge, and it's important. And when it will, will be systematized and will it be, uh, when there will be reflections on this, so then probably the uh, society will be more skillful, more power, powerful. And I think that what, what has happened and what's ha happening now, it is a time for learning. And so the learning is a, is a very... Uh, very crucial thing of all of this, because before that, there were nothing like that in Belarus for like long times, probably never even, probably even never for the whole history of the country. So that that's what I wanted to mention. Uh, thank you. But at the same time, you know, we also find the similar situation because actually Antonina already started to mention because actually the serious issue, it's a 
big crisis of resources. I don't know how it's right now in Belarusian situation, but in Russia, it was already for quite long time, apart from kind of gallery production, actually for independent kind of um, critical activities, it was very limited space. Even, you know, Russia much bigger and larger, but at the same time, even for activist networks, there is no kind of tangible ground where you can really rent space, you know, do it maybe in some confidential circle, certain type of practices. Right now they try to criminalize any form of educational activity. So it's just very fresh movement in Russia. So we don't know yet how it will be implemented. So, and then it really make many people in particular of young generation totally depressed because you don't see the space where you can really survive and produce something. You know, Heim Sokol, very interesting Russian art. He considered that right now it's time to move to the list of paper, <laughs> you know, and to walk in the kind of, you know, was Russian expression to walk in the table, you know, which is possible, but quite depressive and uh, no, with the knowledge of that certain form of massive mobilization, certain kind of, um, public communication which involves so many people but at the same time what I think that or at least my impression from far that Belarusian society demonstrates such incredible level of solidarity mutual support and inventions so that really provides certain hope and also I would say that compared to Russian situation it's much more advanced or at least what it was demonstrated through that kind of urgent mobilization. So I was really, really impressed in many ways, like many of our colleagues. You know, we have here, actually, I haven't mentioned, I don't really need to share, but we made a very weird exhibition of non-artists. And maybe it brings us into that very interesting debate. There was a Belarusian diaspora, the guys who are mostly kind of IT or kind of different type of creative jobs who are live in Russia for a long time. Some of them even have Russian citizenship, but there was completely, there was no diaspora before event of revolution. But when it happens, they start to politically mobilize themselves, doing some actions in front of uh, Belarusian embassy or consulate. And then they come to us and say they would like to make exhibition about Belarusian revolution. And I guess it was one of the best show I ever, ever seen because it was done by people who don't make art. They make, it was completely, you know, it's hard to explain. Maybe I should really show some pictures, mm, but a bit kind of Hirschhorn, you know, style, you know, a lot of the paperwork, you know, the boxes with some Xerox images, wall painting, graffiti. So they bomb the whole gallery. You can be critical about it, but at the same time, in this certain naivety was such amazing energy that compared to more kind of polished, you know, conceptual type of exhibition, mm -hmm. which even I see, and I don't mind, I absolutely appreciate this kind of artistic practices, but at the same time, it, that has that roughness and that certain kind of angriness, you know? We made few events with them, so it was also quite interesting, watch some films and discussion. So I was really impressed how, let's say, just the people are able to create something in Rosa House of Culture is not white cube, but kind of white cube. So it was really, really impressive. But maybe we can open a uh, floor and maybe some questions comes from audience. I see Mao. Oh yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first, thank you so much, Olga and Antonina and Alexei for your, yeah, very lucid and precise and analysis and sharing also the, the kind of, uh, uh, yeah, the actions uh, um, and I was interested in uh, in Antonina's distinction between the actions that are more, let's say, kind of heroic and the long-term 
uh, art, which you describe as a long-term art. Um, and um, yeah, my, my question was, is this long-term art still possible in absence of infrastructures, uh, or maybe it's even working better in absence of infrastructure, or do you still need infrastructure to feed that kind of long-term interventions? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the example of EEFFF is, is perhaps more striking because it's an ongoing project. So yeah, that's, that's my question. I think it depends because we have uh, examples uh, when it, uh, for example, the long term, uh, you know, when uh, instrument of arts uh, creates a situation uh, to involve people and to, to create this, uh, the general or the common, um, the common uh, space or the common uh, experience uh, that created uh, for the supporting of uh, infrastructure or uh, how to say in the gallery or outside the gallery i remember the um, i um i mentioned i i didn't i didn't mention but we have example when for example lena prince and marina naprushkina and the gallery u created the embodiment um uh, workshop when people uh, they create uh, different test case and uh, gather together people um, to make this embodiment uh, to um, uh, to make together and this picture was concerned with um, the process scene for example the chain of solidarity and the thing that is very important because uh, due to this action uh, we have opportunity to create uh, the uh, how to say the practice of future we can create the future uh, community uh, that create a uh, if not the whole infrastructure, because I understand when we speak about, especially when we speak about uh, uh, horizontal uh, infrastructure, it means that it takes a lot of time, it, it, it takes a lot of um, engagement and not, uh, the, not about time, but about uh, how power and strength people should be uh, involved in this process. But at the same time, uh, when we, um, uh, um, when um, different people uh, came to know, uh, uh, came to this situation, uh, tried uh, uh, to uh, to exchange uh, their different experience. I think that is create uh, the future is a practice of future. And uh, for example, I, I'd like to return to our exhibition every day. I see that uh, two of my colleagues, uh, uh, curator also uh, is uh, um, there. Uh, mm -hmm. We uh, many discussed about the future and the temporality of their uh, protest. And we um, we make it as a metaphor of this process, the, uh, the expression from the text of of the Belarusian artist, Belarusian artist Olga Sosnovskaya, uh, he, she when she describes the time of protest, uh, she used uh, she used the expression um, "future perfect continuous." It means that uh, when we haven't uh, the line of time, but uh, when we have opportunity to practice future. Uh, today, but at the same time, we we are very fear about the past. And I remember a very brilliant work of uh, Alexei Tolstoy uh, about uh, if the past uh, will not end. Uh, when we when he also combine uh, the future and the past. And uh, uh, well, what I want to say that uh, the future is also about infrastructure. So I, that's why for me is very important uh, the um, the practice that create situations that create uh, or try to create this infrastructure because uh, due to this people uh, start to practice future today. Thank you, Antonina. Thanks. Thank you. Any more comments? I want to just briefly add probably yeah. that all this situation is kind of practice in the future for me actually all this what, what is going on is still the practice of future because uh, it was kind of delaying of this moment of something else something new 
And uh, last year, this something you just manifested itself. Uh, it manifested itself on the streets and this and that. And yeah, we, we're all inside, but still it's happening now. And it happened somehow so far in, like kind of in parallel, yeah, and some chats and some not so open activities, but it's still the manifestation of future. We, we see it more, mm. more brightly now, so. Uh, can I um, just also share my concern? Because actually right now we are also kind of shocked because it looks like any type of activity which becomes a little bit more publicly visible immediately becomes um, almost impossible. The exhibitions, the festival, which tackles certain issues, even in indirect way, might be shut down, exhibition not open, or comes self-censorship when people simply know by <laughs> their consciousness that this better not to <laughs> show or not to tackle these discussions. What would be our answer? Because actually it demands like, you know, I'm <laughs> not a young guy. And actually I remember Soviet time, which developed a certain kind of language of exodus because there was certain issue was absolutely impossible to deal in public sphere. Of course you can um, sneak your some of your artistic work abroad and do kind of full scale show even <laughs> at some alternative Venice Biennial or I don't know where, everywhere actually, uh, outside of place where you live, you know, or you can simply emigrate as many people did already in Belarus. So what would be our answer in the situation of that kind of total control? Because before we work with so-called authoritarian, but not totalitarian society. But right now it looks like we are slowly entering this kind of stage where any kind of um, articulation, enunciation sounds less and less possible. So would be that kind of dissident answer which we knew from Soviet time, would be our future or you expect that it will be something happening and of course it prepare for example you remember that actually perestroika when things the system start to collapse then it becomes quite incredibly present everywhere because it was real demand for certain kind of so-called non-official art. So for me, that actually kind of new border between official and non-official, how it will be structured again, or is it not an urgent issue? Olga, please, if you can, I, I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I, for me, this question sounds a little, um tricky because i think we already live in some kind of totalitarian uh yeah. and i'm not only talking about uh, corporate you know corporate capitalism that creates this kind of enclosure right that encloses everything that every gesture even the most radical gesture becomes so depoliticized in our um, exhibition spaces and so on but i'm also talking about political uh, realities and democracies like uh, Western uh, democracy, like for example in the US, what's happening in the US now, you know, that it's like also a big uh, political upheaval with Black Lives Matter and uh, recent uh, last elections, but there, uh, just yesterday I heard that many states started passing their absolutely draconian laws that uh, prevent any kind of protest in the future you know, uh, uh, in the physical space, so that they, they actually will incriminate people for participating in the um, uh, unpermitted protests. Mm. They also allowed, they also allowed their, um, uh, their cars, for example, the drivers to hit the protesters, you know, and uh, they, uh, yeah, they ground them immunity for hitting the protesters. Wow. So th this laws were passed in uh, Oklahoma, in Florida, yesterday, Florida is like the most horrible state. Uh, it's going to, uh, to be passed in Iowa, you know, in uh, Ohio and many. So we actually, 
uh, uh, getting this backlash everywhere in the world, you know, because of this uh, uh, activism, because the because of so many revolutions already <laughs> have happened. So and uh, and their forces, you know, that, that they trying to consolidate to, and they're trying to respond this way. So this is why I think that this uh, totalitarianism is slowly, kind of well, slowly. Um, getting into that and it's just like in Russian Belarus it's uh, gotten the much higher level and much more horrible uh, takes like much harsher forms and this is why it's so difficult but this is why I was thinking uh, about my question uh, I wanted to formulate my question uh, to the our Belarusian participants uh, what do you think the rest of the world and uh, people from outside, what do you think they can learn from, you know, you situation now, from your mobilization and from your despair? Um, because I think that there are things that we can learn uh, from you. Thank you, Tonya, Alexei, would you like to comment? We have learned a lot. <laughs> you know, one thing which we learned, even a few hundred thousands of people on the street can't change this system, you know? And that was quite impressive for us because we are so far away from that. And actually, it's not just what we learned, but actually what Putin learned. Not even yeah. about a few thousand people on the street. Never, you know, never. And that for us, it really was quite recently very shocking, very shocking lesson. But at the same time, if you maybe, Tonya and Alexei, I have quite a straightforward comment because actually what came into my mind right now in few recent discussion, actually is that so-called China model where you have one ruling party, which no one can contest. It's absolutely kind of closed group of ruling class and open censorship. So we have a quite serious example of exhibiting in China where best Western curators tell us, okay, I invite this work, but I'm not sure if censor will, will allow that to exhibit. I say, and then you close the show as a protest. They say, no, we don't close the show. Dmitry, you are naive. It's a big money. Of course, we do the show without this piece. And we suggest you to offer another piece. We offered another piece. It was not allowed again, you know? And I said, and now, where is the limit? They say, you know, they don't really tackle the whole composition of our art biennial or museum show, but okay, it will be without your work. Very simple. So the West absolutely easily co-opt with uh, regime in Arab countries, which not allowed definitely certain statements and most of artists or the West most critical one accepted, you know? That's kind of, again, that kind of dystopian future which we all somehow right now facing. So, and I don't know for me what would be the answer, again, back into that kind of marginal, as Alexei explained, also partisanship position, but without even partisanship. You simply try to keep as far as distant to society as possible. But in Belarus, I guess the promise that actually the majority of society on your side, it's actually the problem with Russia because we are absolutely definitely in my tiny minority, again, you know, as a recent protest show and in this marginal situation you might be somehow protected because they're not yet interested in it and we can do quite a lot of stuff for very limited audience but at the same time definitely streets and broader public and addressing society is at large is not really the case so sorry for that kind of very random speculation but it's my impression for today i can i can go briefly through all the questions that i just yes, <laughs> wrote down. yeah we have time some people left but we have certain circle yeah. to continue yeah i just go briefly like 
uh, about learning about this, this uh, what, what, what to learn from Belarus, from from the uh, to to the people in other countries. Uh, I believe that uh, yeah, there are two parties I, I think that are learning now. <laughs> the uh, one party is uh, kind of those who would like to change something, and uh, the other party who wants to keep the status quo. So. And uh, everybody is learning about this. Like it's not only Putin learns, but like, in other countries, like I, I guess also there, are, there should be analysis of uh, all the situation that somehow uh, just like several uh, hundred people come into the street and all they have these uh, white, red, white flags, and nobody knew where those people were before. But they're like kind of ready and <laughs> they're ready and going out and like and before there was nothing like for years and uh, so probably like for me it's um, it's about technologies and about persuasion and about uh, the information uh, the, the, the spread of the information so uh, I'm a bit critical to this um, uh, last presidential campaign as I don't see it more as a political campaign but more like political campaign. Uh, because we don't we don't have in Belarus we never had in Belarus so quite a structure of political parties and different uh, different backgrounds of uh, political thought yeah different like for instance like uh, leftist party or like green party or like social democrats or something like that no unfortunately and uh, that wasn't even that couldn't like just factually it wasn't there since. Uh, since never, I guess. Yeah. So in in the beginning of nineties, it didn't happen as, as a like multi 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 party multi party structure. Yeah, it didn't happen. So and then it was oppressed and so, and uh, so this was a vote against. And uh, uh, I guess the information is a key, and uh, technology like internet is a key to this. Yeah, it, it is not new, but uh, these alternative uh, structures they still can be created not in the physical space not in the in some galleries and institution they can be created online like it was we had like this uh, alternative for central election committee that was in telegram board <laughs> yeah and, and why and every it's not about like uh, who counts it's about who people believes yeah, and if the majority of people believe to Telegram bot and some uh, gigs, some programmers, so probably it is so. Yeah, it's about the authority and about the legitimacy of the of the power. So, yeah. Uh, so I think that it's uh, the the important thing is uh, this alternative, alternative structures that are already present. And. Uh, is it a China model or not? I, I don't know because it's quite quite a hard to say because there is a different there is censorship on, on, on online on this stuff. We are, we are not still there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite a risk actually. It's uh, the, the highest risk is the control of the internet, control of the information traffic about this because this communication it can still run alternatively in Belarus and I believe in Russia and other countries. And this can be a background for, for changes. It can be an opportunity for changes. So that because the, this space is not not only physical. This this all this situation that had happened last year, it wasn't in physical space before the last moment. Mm. So it was mostly in con connections, mostly in minds of people, mostly in the and even on the not on the websites sometimes. Yeah, because we have had this structure that we're running tele te telegram channels. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so in chats on local chats of the yard so it's Chinese yeah and uh, I want to uh, yeah this can be alternative and I want to briefly comment on this situation in Russia and Belarus this uh, to come how, how to compare this I, I think that it is more complex situation in Russia it's more complicated and it's really different because uh, I I'm not sure that I can state that we have like this majority of support for the opposition figures or something like that. it's still diverse not so many people i don't know trust tikhanovska completely yeah but tikhanovska the candidate is a it's not a, like original candidate that come to uh to for, for, for to 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 the voting polls yeah she she's a candidate for some 
somebody else for her husband yeah that everybody just agreed okay we're going to vote for them for her yeah and um, uh, this trust is kind of different but there is an agreement there should be changes but it, it, it is impossible to keep this past running and running in the loop and uh, that's kind of that's general agreement i believe in so because it can be different modes how it should be reorganized but it should be reorganized this is a consensus in russia it's different situation totally because russia is multinational state like huge multinational state and there are still uh, this uh, uh, post-colonial issue there all over the place uh, so a lot of problems that still are not fully articulated even yeah so so it's it's quite a mess guys <laughs> i don't know what you're gonna do with yeah. But um, can we imagine another um, approach to politics, which maybe will not be so straightforward, confrontational, but at the same time keeps certain kind of possibility for change and organizing communities? For example, again, I'm talking from Russia. Uh, and I would say that right now we have quite complete crash of all activist network, which were kind of associated with the new left and social movements. But at the same time, what really comes to the fore is feminist movement. So actually, it's really growing. I see in our environment that most of participants are female and feminist and have different agenda. So we have quite unique situation when three wave of feminism coming at once, you know, not like one after another, but <laughs> different approaches from. And it's quite unique. And I would say at the same time, it also creates a certain kind of, yeah, silencing and repression but at the same time, not at the same scale as like, let's say, Navalny figure and around him or other kind of direct opposition. Of course, there are some excess like the case of Yulia Tsvetkova, but it's more kind of local and also quite weird. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, could I imagine more, but at the same time, yeah, still and even larger institution allow more and more these voices. I would say the same with LGBT, despite the pressure and certain kind of, uh, how to say, yeah, shutting down the events or festivals. At the same time, it's become more and more present and even, you know, Russia sent to Eurovision <laughs> female <laughs> singer who obviously pro LGBTQ uh, plus position and also quite up uh, openly feminist. So you know that's kind of field which not totally colonized by the power would allow us to imagine different forms of artistic articulation and possibilities to build growing communities. And then inside them could be possible different debates and certain debates on aesthetics, because for me right now, I also see and we reflect in my uh, set of um, assemblies that it was actually we made very interesting debate with um, uh, John Graham about that shift from criticality to care, for example, that for me right now also the many uh, quite explicit uh, turn in art, which I'll see comes from that kind of finishing of that kind of critical approach and starting to build something which is, let's say, less critical, or maybe I call it to criticize with care, to care with critique. So it also opens up completely new aesthetic articulation, which I wouldn't underestimate. So I think it's really give us certain possibility even inside that authoritarian regimes. And maybe as Olga said, it's actually worldwide in different forms offer us certain possibilities to survive and actually 
keep some promises for the future and develop them. Well, some people can't. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't, I, I don't know who is Andrei Dureka, but let's welcome Andrei Andrei Dureka. Andrei Dureka is a friend um, I see. Uh, of Belarus Norses. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I um, want to ask maybe people, maybe those who remained. Um, yes, exactly, because I see, maybe you I don't know if it's Olga Sosnovska or not. <laughs> Ulyana, I definitely see, it was the artist whom you show, yes, Tonya? Brilliant work. Remind me also Silent Piquet by um, Sirenka. You know, but at the same time, also more kind of politically urgent, so to say. So, thanks, Oliana. It's really very powerful work. I have seen it many times and really was impressed. So, it's really kind of iconic, I would say. Irie, maybe you. You from Tallinn. You know many situations <laughs> from outside. <laughs> You know, I don't know other people. <laughs> oh, Irish. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. You thank you for Yeah. I am in Thailand. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't really have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you for this very interesting talk. And I have been trying to uh, follow these events in Belarus over the past months and and I think there is something very interesting happening in terms of this relation of art and politics and also what has been touched here as well I think what is maybe most interesting from my perspective is also when you know because artists also they tend to claim this position of monopoly over image mm -hmm. production you know? and what happens when when this political image production is happening on on such mass scale so I think these kinds of Mm. Um, very interesting questions come up, and, and uh, yeah, I just want to say that I found it very interesting your Thank conversation, you. but I don't have any sharp questions now <laughs> to pose. <laughs> we all don't have, we have so many that finally it's none for me. Yeah, but at the same time, I guess it's really a very important situation, and I'm sure it will be more kind of events. You know, I was also amazed. I was preparing kind of impromptu exhibition for 1st of May and I passed through that collection of Belarusian posters online, protest posters, which actually I came from the website of the exhibition in Arsenal. I don't remember what the name of these people who did it online. You can freely download it in full resolution. And I was really amazed because I think that my, my Kim Teminko, one of the um, uh, one of the creator of this uh, uh ah, he us. Aha. So Maxim, it's really I was so impressed because right now we also with a lack of political imagination, I see right now, for example, just before Navalny protest many people complain because you know if you really look back for example 2011 2012 the first protest called winter protest in russia was so playful sociologists really collect incredible amount of that so-called visual anthropology when people draw their own signs and making post and right now oh greg is back <laughs> yeah. and right now many people not many but few people complain that they don't know what to say you know how because poster i work a lot with the poster you know it's my favorite medium but when i saw this collection i was said oh my god i was really and actually i was about to write maybe to you because Alexei Brissona gave me some contact because just to let you know that we would like to print a few posters with all credits and show them and roll the House of Culture on our yeah. first of May. You're very welcome. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you. But I was really wow. And different, some of them have authorship, others not. So it was also a very interesting mixture of kind of creation of professional, let's say professional graphic or maybe just artists and just people. So it looks like, or at least I couldn't find any. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Good. 
Oh, uh, there is one question in, I'm an American artist who is coming to Belarus in a year for an artist residency. I'm trying to learn as much as I can until then. Thank you very much for this discussion. Thank Jane, thank you. I hope you can welcome American guy if it will be possible to come to Belarus. Ah, here you are in one year. We hope it will. What kind of residency in Belarus? Um, CEC Arts Link. I see. Oh. Yeah, so we're just waiting. Mm. Like... With Susan Katz or it's another people? Yeah, I'm yeah. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very um, a good moment to go to Belarus. <laughs> So you, learn, you can learn a lot, but you have to be, you also have to watch your back, you know. You know, yeah. I was just met Susie a few days ago and she was so desperate because, you know, the whole year and there was no residencies. I was trying to do something online. And most of people who plan to come to Petersburg, because we were talking about Petersburg mostly, and they were all completely lost because it was so hard to follow and online residency was disaster right now. And actually with the escalation of Cold War, I'm pretty sure it also similar case for Belarus. So all kind of American institution in our context looks super suspicious. And I don't know how long and how far it might escalate looks like it's quite unlimited yeah so and um, yeah for that but it's not just about u.s institution for example if you talk about sustainability of that kind of networks for us as a dissident was always a space to rely on different western institution but i guess it's not the case of belarus but recently they start to attack henrik Böll stiftung rosa luxembourg stiftung for certain conspiracy against uh, russian regime so right now we don't know when they stop so it will be really last possibility for many people continue research continue certain practices get some productions get some visibility and it might easily be over in one day. It's super simple. Uh, uh, Dima, I wanted to ask, maybe that would be the concluding question about what, uh, because we were talking about strategies, what to do and how artists should act. Uh, I, I think one of the strategies that was mentioned here briefly, and because we brought up Maxim, website could so mm -hmm. maybe maybe one of the strategies is archival strategies so mm -hmm. so how because I, I know that there are several projects that are trying to archive what uh, have already uh, been done right during this protest by artists and non-artists and collaborative co uh, works on this. So, and uh, I see this uh, website, the Kul Prasvet has also is attempt to you know, archive, even so I know that artists produced posters particularly for this side, right, to be uploaded on this side. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, there were some uh, protest, uh, sorry, slogans that posters that were, and signs that were uh, created during the protest and on the street also was brought to this archive. No, it was amazing actually interface where you'll see how it was actually picture from the protest. And yeah, I, yeah. yeah, the sign. Yeah, amazing, yeah. Amazing. I actually had a question about that. If it's really like correct to do this kind of combinations, because uh, the, uh, some works were produced for as a as a, as a artwork by professional artists. Even so, it made available to be used by protesters. But at the same time, it's professional artists, and some were some posters were anonymous. You know that they were created by anonymous authors and brought to this website. Anyway, this is just one example. Uh, but I know that Alex uh, Alexey Barisonek is also working and created uh, an archive project. So maybe some of you can comment on that. Um, so how urgent is this strategy of archive? 
Well, I think it's uh, really important and we mentioned uh, uh, because I am totally sure that archive can be not only as an archive, like a research archive, but like a political activist gesture also. And uh, for me, it's very important because uh, such project as uh, could protest me, or for example, uh, uh, we mentioned in our article the project by uh, Sergei Shabohin when he uh, interviewed people uh, and to create um, the main, um, uh, to create the map of the consumption of different concepts uh, of protests is very important because it's very important to, uh, to collect uh, before the fact that it become uh, the part of history, or the official history narrative, uh, because um, before it keep to the um, book narration, because it's totally uh, not totally death, but is the power uh, is more about power. So I think that this uh, uh, strategy as archive is creation of archives. Uh, it's it's opportunity to create a different uh, narration and different story or how to uh, to represent it is a very important that of course it's a political um, it's the political idea. Yeah, I would like to comment briefly as uh, <clears throat> it's quite in line what I already uh, said. Uh, I guess like the general problem that we had it more like related to art and culture and maybe to other other areas of knowledge uh, in Belarus, yeah, it was uh, uh, the problem of the material, the problem of sources and texts. Uh, and they're like not only the texts in foreign languages, like in English, for instance, but the texts in Belarusian about the, the, the situation in art, the situation in culture, in di different spheres. And the analysis is quite a, it's, it's quite a thing that we lack. And uh, I think the process of learning, not only archiving, but interpreting it, uh, working with the archives, writing texts, and uh, uh, I don't know, stating some opinions and keeping discussions, that creates a, creates a background for the solid structure for further actions, for further work. So that uh, I think like this experience, it's really should be evaluated and maybe not like put into one solid option, one solid version of it, but with a plural, with a multitude, multitude of opinions, it should be somehow systematized or presented at least. Yeah, that, that can be a, a quite a nice work for the future. Mm. No, no, yeah, I totally agree because actually, and also what Alexei already mentioned, because you know, right now we are a little bit confused because we discuss two modes of operating because announcement it's more kind of position of artists and to the bright moment of revolution there is no time for art but right now in dark times it's time for archiving time for contemplation time for reconsideration for building certain kind of sometimes even clandestine forms of communication, confident circles. So it's completely another kind of issue, you know, and completely another form of aesthetics and mental state, I would say. So that's, unfortunately, we were kind of moved by time into that kind of new direction, which is absolutely fine. But at the same time, it's not undermined the question in which we may you know, in announce. So yeah, I'm also right now working on one big archive project and actually Plekhanov archive and its role for revolution, for example, because you know, we know that most of um, places or unfortunately our Egyptian colleagues couldn't join us, Philippe and Jasmina, they made a film. It was shown at Venice Biennial at German Pavilion, actually one of the most brilliant film how workers in Egypt will, trying to make a strike during revolution. Maybe you all saw it. It was really, it was quite as powerful as Hitler's style piece, which was next to that piece, actually. 
Yeah, and now they actually built a website which actually constitutes from different fragments of their filming and different films of the protest of Arab revolution. Actually, it's very interesting that because of that waves, we come to that situation where we actually, uh, because of political limitation and different other maybe emotional one, where people concentrate more and more on that kind of historical work, which I absolutely agree, give us certain possibilities to move further in the future. So yeah, that's really, I guess would be also possible right now. And this poster archive, I guess it will be also one day quite important to- uh, I'm uh, going to send a link to this uh, project that Dmitry mentioned, so since we- I think it's open yeah. on, my, on my table. <laughs> yeah, I have this in, because it got the release prize. Uh, or at least it was nominated for, for the prize. So I have information about this project. So uh -huh. I'm going to post it. I see. <laughs> it's right now. It's on the screen right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's super. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's really amazing. Anyway, <clears throat> if we more or less <laughs> exchange of things, you know, for me, it's also very interesting because we just also created new film because also I guess certain type of film production because film is there, it's really also a possibility to reflect and to also make it as a kind of educational tool which now people Yelena Gapova oh my god <laughs> so I think we can slowly move into Russian language <laughs> yeah I haven't seen Yelena for a long time anyway so привет Yelena <laughs> thanks for joining we, we almost finished. <laughs> yeah, you well, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, I just I, yeah. I couldn't join uh, earlier. Yeah. Would you like to comment something, <laughs> or you'd like to listen? <laughs> but I, I, no, I I just joined. There's nothing I can say. I I well, if there's something where, I can listen to. Where are you now? In the uh, in 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 Michigan. Ah, in Michigan. Ah, yes. Pretty far away. Pretty far away, yeah. Anyway, so anyone would like to sum up or be more or less there? But at the same time, I would really try to maybe finish on optimistic note that I'm still believing in incredible power of art in different mode, in the mode of the protest, in the moment of request reflection in the dark time and the bright times, we should really insist that art has certain power which people need. And actually sometimes, because again, I mentioned before that we work a lot with the Zapatista and sometimes when you talk to simple people, you'll see how they believe in art. It's very interesting that our convention move us permanently into that kind of self-negating mode. Ah, we are so close to capital, we incorporated into all that machines. But when you talk to simple people, they say, wow, you know how we come to the protest? We come in through the songs, we come in through the imagery, we come in through the films. That's why the artist plays incredibly important role in maintaining that certain kind of radical and resistant imagery. And it's also from my point of view, it's really a generic anti-capitalist activity because it produced, it built on completely another machine of desire and imagination, opposite to capitalist estrangement and monetarization and so on. Without this belief, I could hardly <laughs> continue. <laughs> well, many, you know, many activists and especially left, left activists, they, uh, talk more and more about the end of art, mm. you know, uh, about mm -hmm. this uh, disillusion of art and this kind of 
uh, practice when everybody is an artist or at least the potential, right? And potential. Mm -hmm. And the Zapatista, Zapatista movement is a very good example. Uh, so, and also art is not only uh, just a human necessity, but it's also a tool to create communities, right? So that mm -hmm. when you produce the um, uh, painting together like mural or you weave something together, some tapestry and, you know, flag, making flags together and uh, things like, like that. But another part of the leftist, uh, left academics are still believe in autonomy, right? Art are autonomy that art can can be an instrument of uh, a revolution only when you, or let's say, political transformation only when you uh, allow sort of an autonomy for the art, right? So when art is protected and cultural uh, field has some some kind of like sacred, right? a uh, space where uh, things can be rehearsed right and happened and uh, I don't think that these two positions some kind of reconciled uh, mm. so I think that it's still uh, and I mentioned I post I even posted here this uh, concept of militant militant art read by mm -hmm. Dürer, uh, but um, that I think Robert, uh, uh, John Roberts uh, very much uh, agree with uh, and trying to promote it. So that art uh, uh, have this militant uh, characteristics only when it's autonomous, mm -hmm. you know, only when it speaks out of uh, its own autonomy. Right. So when artists go to the palace, Belarusian artists go to the palace of art, the main state run exhibition space, and they stage this action of protest. They talk from the autonom autonomy, right, because they kind of like negate their uh, traditional exhibition practices and they say, no, we don't want to exhibit our work and our art with you anymore. We want to uh, actually create non-art, right? So and we can, we want to make this uh, uh, action of solidarity and we, we want to show you something else that you, you will probably not like. So um, yeah, I think that this kind of negativity, right, that uh, ours has demonstrated is actually quite interesting tactics and it can be possible only from inside from position of autonomy mm. right or some sort of autonomy um anyway just just a thought mm. you know i have quite different you know that's very adornian approach to autonomy which is oh, yeah, yeah. conventional yeah. I'm coming from a Marxist position of autonomy, like autonomy of living labor from capital. So I'm against that concept of the capitalist totality. So what was a great invention of Marxism that living labor have autonomy from the capital. That's why it can resist and overthrow the dictatorship of the capital. And actually, I'm sorry again for the, <laughs> my own speculation, but at the same time, that really is a certain hope that actually that kind of workers' autonomy, like autonomia operaria, as you know, that Italian movement, that for us very interesting can be translated into cultural production. When we say that capitalist relation in cultural world, so artist has autonomy but it's not adorning autonomy of that formal innovation no it's not it's autonomy of dream autonomy to institute another type of relation and that's for me is a crucial difference from adorning position anyway i'm also quite you know because you're also talking at the end of that um proposal about autonomy so yeah it's quite complex reflection maybe greg biggest specialist in autonomy issues not really but i i think dima uh, this this question of autonomy can't be separated anymore from the way capitalism as an effective or you want to call it a, a networked uh, concept is mm, sucking that down into itself and trying to extract uh, value out of that somehow, right? So 
I, as much as I'm also in the school of autonomy, autonomous or operata, you know, Italian approach, I think we have a very complicated situation. The Tronti's idea of the social factory has now become so widespread mm. that is there an autonomous space for anyone at all? Is that even possible? Mm. Uh, and I put forward a different different term, which is to say we're kind of in a in a bare art world now, like mm. uh, like as stealing from a gambin or retooling a gambin, mm. where you nobody thinks anymore that art is separated from ideology. We all see those connections. Mm. And we have to sort of acknowledge that uh, nakedness. Uh, that's mm. where I think that's where we are at. Mm. And the flip side being that capital is now using many things that artists innovated uh, to extract some kind of value. I don't know what it is exactly. Mm. Mm -hmm. No, it's a subsumption. It's a subsumption. Mm -hmm. But may maybe th this is the strength of the Belarusian artists that because the capital is not not is not yet, <laughs> not yet uh, kind of enclosed everything there, and um, uh, so there were not no spaces like garage or Pinchuka mm -hmm. art center, you know, like created in Belarus. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was, so the capital is not like that kind of oligarchical capital is mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. So this is why ours is kind of still ha have, uh, ironically, right? Our just in Belarus do have autonomy uh, in this sense of the, like in relation to labor, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I can see how quickly they organized, especially and uh, artist designers is actually uh, actually got in the center because they start producing this, all of a sudden this uh, iconic posters, right? Like Vladimir Tesler and uh, Anna Redko. Mm -hmm. So, and this is artists whose job is so well, uh, uh, defined, right? Mm -hmm. So that they knew exactly who they are, and all, all of a sudden they became this political mm -hmm. activists, right? While never being political activists before, maybe Tesla was. I, I'm not sure, but others were not. So and yeah, this kind of position in between that, that maybe maybe this is what makes it so strong and spectacular, you know, in this process. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add a little bit on this. Uh, I'm actually, I'm a bit critical about this absence. Okay, we don't have these institutions like Garage or like Pinchuk or like VAC in Russia or Ukraine. Yeah, but still, uh, this, um, it was Antonina talking about this position of hero, position of the hero artist, the position of individual practice. It's quite a problematic. I really uh, find it problematic. I, I can recall that. Uh, Last year, in the beginning of summer, uh, during this pandemic time, we were invited with Antonina actually to join the conversation about these uh, art practices during this pan pandemic pandemic time during the lockdown. We didn't we didn't have lockdown in Belarus actually, but what what to do? Yeah, all the galleries uh, were closed and they closed themselves actually because it wasn't a mandatory stuff, but it was kind of ethical thing and. Uh, when we were trying to discuss the issue of labor, of artistic labor coming from the, from our, our, our perspective, yeah, like, uh, to use this time. I, I do remember we had a conversation also in Zoom uh, with Mitri and with others, with, with Mitri and others also, like uh, around the same time. So we came with this um, problematizing of the labor of, of artists in the time of lockdown to the institution, self-organized institution, let's say, Kaha Gallery. It's a small gallery, really community-based space based on the, some theater activity and the art-related activities. So people couldn't couldn't support our theme, our inputs, yeah, because they were mostly thinking about, okay, we're doing shows, we're producing artworks, and we want some future for us. I'm not a, if income is a kind of dream or incidentalization is a dream. But and because of it isn't like it isn't so problematic, like people can see the problem of the big institution in other countries. Here people cannot see these problems. Mm -hmm. So it's still quite a quite yeah, there are opportunities, there are other other modes of, of self-organization of the community. Community sees it's a different mode, I guess. But still, they're kind of utopia of waiting for some big business that can come and give us some money. Like, 
yeah but it, it's a little bit different from what i was saying because i was exactly saying that uh because of the lack of the institutional support and infrastructure for artists uh, uh, this precariousness and also uh, any absence of artist fees and right so that artists don't exhibit their works but they don't get paid uh and it because it just doesn't this idea doesn't even like come across the across the you know the organizers mind uh anyway i i was i was um what i meant is that this state of precariousness uh, can be uh, inspirational also, so it can be um, motivation, you know, for uh, for artists to uh, to become to lead the you know the the the, polit the political transformation and revolution. So the state of precariousness is is kind of this is what Badio was talking about, right? So that there, th this is where the militancy of art. Mm -hmm. is forged mm. and i think that it's important that the community is uh, realizing that and trying to get gain something from from mm -hmm. that you know from this moment you know if i can say if you're interested because actually right now i'm more and more returning to that concept of that gift culture and gift economy because the artists operate from my point of view, and I can actually <laughs> articulate it more <laughs> profoundly, that actually what artists do is not real labor. It's more kind of a gift. And I know that it sounds maybe <laughs> a little bit suspicious <laughs> and mysterious, but at the same time, I guess as long as we continue to speak about the radical anti-capitalist activity, the gift is the last resort of that certain kind of abundance of energy and willing to contribute. Of course, I'm not talking a lot at all that we don't need to, to fight for labor rights and so on. But for me right now, when more and more artists return to that position that artistic work as the same job as any other job, should be remunerated, should be paid fairly. It's fair enough, but at the same time, they forget that kind of surplus. And surplus for me, considered through that kind of a gift, idea of the gift. And gift is a very incredibly powerful thing. So, and it also not innocent. It has other dark side, like we know from Badiou, you know, that actually it really, only possibility to demand certain sovereignty in that kind of production relation, so and not subjugate to the power of the capital. So I guess that actually the gift is the most subversive and most radical idea which artists can really implement. But do you remember that through the gift economy, the society robbed each other because if uh, someone uh, give a gift, uh, you should uh, give gift more and yeah. more and more. Yes. So it's uh, also uh, can be described as. But um, what I uh, what to add? Uh, how the position of hero became when we uh, when we don't think about uh, the. Uh, uh, the artist as a practice is a real practice is connected that connected with uh, eco economical political situation uh so uh you yeah, it's very easy to become a hero because uh, you uh, you don't uh do something inside the society but you make a gift and uh so you uh it's it's a short uh it's not the direct but it can be the next step for the meta position i understand what you mean and of course that's what i mentioned by dark side of the gift you know potlatch culture by indigenous north american tribes was actually uh banned by 
US and Canadian government because it was so destructive. You know, the whole tribes really <laughs> burn everything down and, you know, and then become really poor. But everyone remembers that actually incredible celebration of potlatch and memories come from one generation to another yeah it's true but at the same time everything has a dark side you know capitalism too and also about hero i wouldn't simply um, undermine this position i guess especially you know we have quite serious reaction um, exchange with olga because in that Arab um, in this um, Egypt article, uh, it was discussion about martyrdom and what is being martyr. And Olga used metaphor that artists sacrifice their profession, their talent to for something else. And I was arguing for me, it's not martyrdom. You know? It's not sacrifice, really. It's something else. But anyway, it's possible metaphor, which I absolutely agree. But at the same time, I would say, you know, also it brings us to very vivid and current political debate. What means the return of Navalny into prison? I was also criticizing that he simply became like Jesus Christ, you know, by his sacrifice, he wanted to raise up whole movement but not everyone jesus christ is a real jesus christ so it was so many fake jesus christ <laughs> jesus christ which came into wrong situation but at the same time i would say like you know rabbi m Rue made amazing piece on martyrs and see lebanon because it's a big big culture which I wouldn't underestimate, especially for revolution. And actually, artist as a real martyr who ready to die for his own or her own art or for her own possibilities to be present could really spark certain movement. So I would say that actually also it's mysterious things, as many things about gift. But I wouldn't say they are not material, they are material, as they can really create a certain kind of spark and many movements actually coming from that single gesture. At least my position, of course, you can also judge like <laughs> real <laughs> uh, sacred act. It's very hard to judge because they can be fake, but at the same time, you always recognize them about the after effects on society. Sorry, we are really run far away from, but I guess it makes sense to speculate. And promotion, but you might find a great writing in the interest of Hiddenstein. Aha. Uh -huh. You mean uh, Greg is with us? Yeah. Okay, I will write this. I will read this. Uh -huh. Data democracy. Okay, guys. I don't know if you have energy because actually to stay online and most of you right now it's already late. Uh, somehow I see how light behind our windows disappeared. <laughs> And right now we are in the dark. Oh, you have nice. I love this Zoom tricks, how people move from one window. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you very much. It was a very nice discussion. And um, uh, yeah, finally I got to talk to you guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm also very, very happy that we met. And thank you so much for organizing it. And I hope we continue our struggle and our journey together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for invitation. Thank you, thank you, yeah. uh, Alexei. Yeah. Thanks. It was a pleasure to talk. Yeah, thank and we'll try to catch up with other debates which happened today simultaneously. We didn't really want it to undermine them. It was it just happened really. I didn't expect. But I'm sure it was also very important thing. I will be in Vienna soon, hopefully, if we manage to travel and meet Olga and Alexei, and yeah, maybe we can continue. 
Okay, and Tonya, come back to Moscow safe. Don't stay in oh, terrible sure. Turkey. <laughs> it's really, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, she's in, in Turkey completely blocked because there is no planes. <laughs> it's uh, oh, Corfu, yeah. it's locked down, which announced from yesterday. On vacation or what, what do you do in Turkey? Uh, yes, I have a no, vacation. Vacation. <laughs> Okay, I stop uh, transmitting. Yeah, so yeah. And see you guys. Ciao. Thank you. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.